here today, as I said, to learn more about uh, about the world of COVID-19 and, and what uh, what stands for us in the future and what we should be doing right now. Um, I'm happy to, to give you a little more information about our speaker, uh, Dr. Bunce. He actually is considered an infectious disease specialist, so this is uh, something that many people may not know a lot about. Um, but he has practiced in Indiana continuously for the past 25 years, so a lot of information. Mostly in Indianapolis, he has practiced, but also in Southern Indiana for the past five years. He's a graduate of Louisiana State University and Tulane University School of Medicine in New Orleans. He also completed his residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in infectious diseases actually at Vanderbilt in Nashville. And then he moved to Indianapolis in 1991. He does have extensive experience in the diagnosis and treatment of many problems in the field of infectious diseases. Um, there are many, many to name, but I felt that these were important so you can understand more about uh, his background. Uh, fever of unknown origin, immunocompromised patients, pneumonia, other pulmonary infections, um, endocarditis, cardiac device and central line infections, uh, many other skin and soft tissue infections, anything, hand infections, diabetic foot infections. Um, the list does go on, but it's important to kind of get an idea about where he comes from. Um, he also does have extensive consultative experience in the areas of infection control, pharmacy and therapeutics, antibiotic stewardship, and even more recently now, public health, as we all know. Um, and with that, um, we'll get to our the meat of our presentation here. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Bunce. And I'm probably already know these things, but I'll reiterate them, that COVID is not going away, um, that we are now seeing, of course, uh, a continuation of maybe the initial surge or a second surge. However you want to put it, uh, case rates are up around the country. Uh, in certain parts of the world, they're up as well. Uh, certainly in Indiana, uh, I think we're a little better off than some of our neighboring states, but we are seeing uh, higher rates of infection. And we're also seeing a, an increase in the hospital censuses around, around the state. Um, we're certainly noticing it in Du Bois County um, with uh, high test positivity rates and so we are definitely seeing this thing spread around. Uh, why is this so? Well, after our, our initial shutdown and um, uh, isolated home order, uh, we've, we've gone out, we've, we've socialized, we do what human beings do. And this is of course very attractive to a virus that uh, is well adapted to us. And so we're spreading it about um, uh, by our social contacts. And, um, uh, so, so that's, that's sort of the bad news, but the good news is we know how the virus works. We know, if we don't know everything about the disease, we do know about transmission. And we have figured out a number of things to try to reduce transmission. Certainly our shutdown taught us one thing, that if we stay at home and stay away from each other, um, we're going to see this virus um, transmission go down and... Um, uh, transmission rates and illnesses and hospitalization rates go down. Um, so um, where does that bring us? Well, we have to learn those lessons, we have to apply them, and that means taking the preventative measures that we've learned about. And that's what the governor's masking order was all about, is that um, wearing masks, social distance, they work. We know they work. We have increasing uh, an increasing accumulation of data to show that, that, that masks work. And so we're encouraging everyone to maintain distances, but to add masks to that, to reduce uh, uh, the epidemic, however we can, however much we can. Um, uh, aside from that, uh, obviously we have other things looming on the horizon. We have the opening of schools, uh, and that is gonna throw uh, kind of a very, very big and unknown factor into the equation. Uh, should we be opening schools? Should we not be opening schools? It's a big question. I don't think there's any completely right or wrong answer. Uh, I think that schools are extremely important and we have a lot of pressure to open them. Uh, and uh, we work with school systems to try to come up with some safe ways to do it, what we think are safe, but we can't kid ourselves because we're gonna have to make adjustments along the way. We will make mistakes. We will have to take a step back and reassess and apply uh, uh, new, new uh, ideas to, to infection control in, in public spheres like schools. Um, there is no proven treatment. Uh, I think everyone knows that. Um, 
hydroxychloroquine has been again and again at this point been shown to be uh, ineffective. Um, whether or not it's dangerous or not, that's up to, uh, 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 that's been disputed. But the fact is, is that it's not a proven or an approved uh, treatment for COVID-19. Do we have things on the horizon? Yes, we do have a drug or two out there that uh, are helpful. Uh, we have um, old drugs like uh, steroids that are very useful in the hospital setting for people who have severe respiratory symptoms and low oxygen levels uh, that have been uh, shown in controlled studies to be useful. Um, a vaccination, yes, I think uh, the uh, effort to, uh, to uh, um, develop a vaccine is, um, uh, is, has been uh, unprecedented in its scope and size and uh, the international nature of this. In the United States, we have a number of vaccines being developed. And, um, but I wouldn't hold out any hope until maybe the first quarter of next year. Um, uh, but I, I'm fairly optimistic that we'll find something, uh, how long it'll work, uh, how effective it'll be, uh, only time will tell, we're gonna learn more. But uh, I don't think that COVID is gonna, gonna walk away from us. And ultimately I think a vaccination is gonna be the answer. I'm open for any questions. I have a lot of other things I could talk about, but I'll, I'll let the questions guide that. I have, do have a couple of questions here already, uh, Dr. Bunce. So one of the first ones, and, um, and please let me know if this is something that you can answer from your role and how you work with Memorial, because I know that, I don't know that people understand how often that you are here on our campus or otherwise. So, um, I will try to do my best to help but assist in this question. But the first one that we do have is, what is happening at Memorial Hospital with this surge? Is there any information that you can offer us with that? Well, in terms of what, what are the measures being taken, uh, fortunately, the measures being taken uh, have been in place now for months. And Memorial Hospital has been extremely proactive in getting ready for this. In fact, one of the advantages that Du Bois County has had is that it's been slow to get here. And um, you know, when it does get here, it catches everybody's surprise. Our rates are high now, but other counties in the state had high rates two, three months ago. So this is a kind of a catching up period, kind of a, a reality check. And Memorial Hospital has been extremely proactive in their um, screening methods, in their personal protective equipment, in limiting visitation, and making sure that the environment is safe for people to go into the hospital. And that's one of the things I'd like to stress is that hospitals actually are safe places. They're probably safer than most of the places in the community. Um, um, I feel very confident going into hospitals, particularly Memorial Hospital and the other hospital I work at, uh, I feel very safe. Um, and uh, so far the infection rates among people who work at the hospital have been quite low. And the chances that a patient are gonna get COVID-19 from the hospital are extremely low. So I think patients should be reassured that the hospital is a safe place to go for care. Okay, very good. Thanks for that, uh, for that explanation. Another question that we have from the group uh, is said, could we hear information on outside public venues versus inside public venues in relation to the effectiveness of face coverings and the mandate? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, the data so far, some of the studies we have, um, the one in particular, uh, show that it's probably, if you take, let's say a group, I'm gonna give you an example. You take a group of 20 people, okay? And you put them in a room. Um, the chances that they're going to transmit COVID are your chances of getting COVID from a person in that group are about 20 times higher if you're in a closed room than if you're outside. Okay, so being outside is helpful due to the circulating air, uh, just, 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 just moving particles out of the way. So being outside is a definite advantage. A mask adds to that, obviously. We don't try to, to um, use one as a substitute for the other. Being outside, being at distance, and being at, at masked all are, uh, give you an additive advantage. Uh, so um, I, I would say that outside venues uh, are safer I think we have data to show that, but a very crowded outside venue with loud music and people in each other's faces without masks is not a safe environment, as we know. You can get COVID on beaches, you can get COVID um, 
in any crowded outdoor environment if you're not careful. No, thanks for that. I think that really helped you putting um, a number to that when you said the 20 times higher because it, you know, we could suspect that with circulating air it would be better, but just how much. So that's, that's an excellent response to that. Thank you. Um, a little bit of a shift um, in the question, Dr. Bunce. Um, how long do antibodies last in the system? That's how the question was posed. The answer is we don't know yet. Uh, obviously, um, people have had antibodies really only for a few months now, some of the early infections. We do know that in some of the other SARS-like infections like SARS-1, MERS, that, that, that antibodies can last for a couple of years and then go away. But we don't really know about SARS-2 is how long protective antibodies. Remember, there's a difference between an antibody response and protective antibody. If you get HIV, for example, you will have an antibody, but it won't get rid of your infection, okay? And it doesn't protect you against further infection. So it's important to know that, 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 that antibodies um, usually clear infection, but don't always clear infection. In COVID, it appears that they do, and it appears that they're effective. And we know that because the virus goes away and people develop antibodies. We also know that the plasma, that has been taken from people who have had COVID and infused into um, patients in, under controlled conditions have, has been shown to be beneficial and is currently being studied. There's no final word out on plasma infusions uh, with antibody uh, as a therapeutic modality, but it does appear that there is at least some effectiveness to that. So um, I can't give you like six months, 10 months, two years, we don't know. Uh, and we won't, we won't know for vaccination either for some time. Okay, thank you very much. Another question now. Um, there is you know, a great deal of concern that the focus you know, now has been put on masks you know, and people and they're not paying attention to personal hygiene, you know, washing hands and sanitizing. Uh, could you please reinforce the priority of all these elements, elements for the prevention and the mitigation of COVID-19? Uh, Certainly, that's an excellent question. I, I, I think if you're going to prioritize the measures to prevent transmission of the virus, I would put um, uh, distance and masking up top, okay? I would put them at the highest level because one thing we know about this virus, it is a virus that is primarily uh, transmitted face to face, okay? My face to your face, your face to my face. Um, yes, do hands play a role? Do surface, may surfaces play a role? Sure, they might. Obviously, if you touch someone else's hands and they have COVID on it and you touch your nose, you can get COVID, just like influenza, okay? Um, I think uh, in the beginning, there was a bit of an overemphasis on surfaces on the sense that, like, hey, well, um, we have to polish everything down and can decontaminate everything. And I think, you know, people were talking about decontaminating groceries and I think it really got out of hand. Um, I don't think that you have to worry about packages coming to your house, et cetera. I, I do think that frequently touched surfaces, uh, particularly in the home when somebody has COVID or in a place where COVID patients are likely to go, like a clinic, wiping down uh, surfaces is very important. Um, uh, if anyone is sick in your household, wiping frequently touched surfaces down is very important. Uh, so there is a role to play for surfaces, but I definitely put a a, a, a priority on masking and distance. Okay, and there was a second piece to that question. I think that you may have uh, uh, answered that, Dr. Bunce, but just to make sure I, I'm complete here, um, and the participant wanted to know what the thoughts were on the aerosol spread of the, the small microns of the virus versus the previous focus on the droplets. And I think you kind of touched on that, but wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think, I think that, that question has, again, become a little bit overblown. And really what's important isn't whether or not, I, I believe there is an aerosol component uh, and there is a droplet component, larger versus very much smaller particles. Obviously, what you're looking at actually is what happens in real life situations. What are the real risks when you're in the room with somebody with COVID? Um, what, what are the attack rates, the actual transmission rates uh, for a person who has been a close contact? And when we look at that data, we're looking at low numbers, 0.5 to 5% you know, attack rates, uh, secondary infection rates in people who have been close contact. So if you're a close contact, uh, you have a, a more influenza-like rate of transmission, higher, of course, but not quite so high as things like measles and chickenpox, whereas you just walk through a room, 
you're going to get it if you're if you're a non-immune person. So I, I would I would have to say that um, uh, that the data seem to support uh, more shorter distance, not not lingering in rooms for five hours. You walk in a room, nobody's in there. You walk out, you have it. They're just that. that I don't think that that's important. Uh, rather than debating a particle size theoretics, I think it's best to look at the the, the actually concrete epidemiologic data that we have. And that would be my answer to that question. No, I think that that's great. Um, we've got another one here, and I feel like this is one that uh, many people bounce around, you know, in terms of social media and, you know, the constant debate, you know, going back and forth. Uh, but our participant says, can you speak to the somewhat misleading idea that increased cases are due to increased testing? And it goes on to say, to what might we attribute the higher positivity rate here versus other counties in Indiana? Well, uh, obviously, the, the idea that 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 if we in te if we increase testing, uh, we have more cases. I, I guess there's a common sense component to that. Yeah, if you look under a rug for bugs, you'll find your bugs. I mean, obviously, you want to be able to discover as many cases as you can. But unfortunately, for that argument, the 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 rate of increase in cases has outstripped the testing rate. So, I mean, right away we have data that 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 disarms that argument. Um, we want to keep, we want to do a lot of testing, but what we look at is the percent positivity rate. For example, the percent positivity rate for Indiana right now on a seven day lag is 7%, somewhere between seven and 8%. That's pretty good. You want that to be under 10%. That means you're doing enough testing and you're discovering the cases that are actually there. Okay, Du Bois County right now is 19%. So what we're seeing is that not only do we have a lot of cases here, but maybe we're not doing enough te uh, uh, testing and we're actually missing some cases. If 19%, uh, if, our, if we have a 19% test positivity rate, we need to do more testing and, and, and we need to find out and isolate those people. Because if you don't identify them, then they amplify the pandemic. They have to be identified because unfortunately 40 to 45% of all transmission is in people who are either asymptomatic and will remain asymptomatic or are pre-symptomatic. Um, and once you develop symptoms, your actual infectivity goes down over the following seven days, about a week. So, so, so we really, this is the tricky thing about this virus is a lot of this transmission, if not most of it, is occurring right before, two days before, the onset of symptoms or right that first day or so. And then it starts to go down because people will withdraw if they're sick. So it is very effective at spreading. We need to identify as many cases in, as we can. And clearly it's not a, we're testing too much issue. Next question, you know, I don't know if this is one for you, Dr. Bunch, or maybe something more on a local level from our county health department, but our participant is curious, is there data that you can share with us on how people have contacted the virus? Is it family member to family member? Is it crowded areas? Is it in shopping centers, restaurants? I think people are concerned. How do I, how do I navigate every single day? I'm not sure where to go and what to do. You know, I, I can't speak for, uh, drill down to how all, you know, the 640 some cases we've had here in Du Bois County, I can't really say um, how I can give you breakdown of age, I can give you all, all those numbers. I mean, the, the, but, but exactly how they got it is unclear. If you look at the bigger picture, if you look at, you know, larger epidemiologic pictures, people are getting this in crowds. They're getting it in crowded places. We know that the surge this new surge, so to speak, uh, started with people in their 20s, teens and 20s, kind of moved a little bit into the 30s. So that's the biggest, the demographics changed somewhat as people started to socialize more. And of course, those are very heavily social uh, years, people going to Florida and other vacations. We saw a lot of that on the media, people really crowded together, just basically ignoring a lot of the things that we learned early on. So yes, um, we're still seeing transmissions uh, in, in places uh, uh, like uh, bars, not so much restaurants where people, where they have mandatory spacing requirements and masking, but bars were are a big cause. I would say family gatherings have been very important. Uh, a lot of families get together, they're tired, they wanna to be back together. Sometimes you'll have 20 people, uh, 
you know, at a, at a, at a, at a party or a wedding. Those are the dangerous uh, things. Those are the, um, obviously a lot of the funeral directors have taken precautions, uh, churches have taken precautions, but not everybody to the same degree. So usually these transmissions occur in groups, in crowds, in crowds of the things you have to be careful. Another place where transmission occurs is in the household. Um, uh, you know, if you've got six, seven people living in your house uh, and somebody's got COVID, it is hard. The, the, you know, if, uh, the attack rates in households can be up to about 16% or more in, 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 as opposed to the random close contact, which is in, in, in uh, less than 1% or single digits. So family settings are, are a concern, people bringing it into the household. Um, as far as mortality rates are concerned, a lot of that has to do with uh, how well have you controlled the virus getting to your vulnerable populations, um, the nursing homes. We know that 50% of the people who have died of Indiana of COVID-19 are over the age of 80 years or older. And um, of course, after the age of 50, mortality rates start to go up uh, slowly at first and then fairly precipitously uh, after 65. And so we do know that age is a risk factor. And if you can protect that population, you may see high case rates, but lower death rates. And right now we're kind of seeing that is that our death rates haven't gone up that much, even though our infection rates and our hospitalization rates have gone up. But it may be that there's just a lag and we're going to see more deaths in, in the coming uh, months. Very good. Um, kind of a different question here. Uh, does blood type play a role in becoming positive or, or being immune to COVID-19? Well, at least two studies that I know of, one from China and another, uh, uh, I think it was an American or European study, showed that type A blood has an association with uh, uh, more serious clinical course. I mean, that's an association now. Uh, we don't know if there's an actual cause and effect. They drill it down to genetic loci. There are probably two or three other genetic predispositions. We don't understand exactly how they work, maybe in some way how they modulate the immune system. But no, that is still um, an area of research right now. But it does appear that type A blood may be at high, uh, slightly higher risk. Uh, other things as well, diabetes, hypertension, um, are, 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 are concerning. Um, any respiratory illness, predisposing respiratory conditions, smoking, COPD, very important conditions uh, that are also associated with uh, uh, um, uh, bad outcomes. Very good. Um, we've really just got a couple, couple more minutes here, uh, if you can believe it, almost uh, time for noon. I know that um, we still have a few outstanding questions. However, I do want to make sure everybody understands too that we oftentimes do have update videos with our Dr. Bunce and also our um, Dr. Treader here at the hospital. And uh, we do plan to have one of those out here in the next uh, few days as well. So please uh, make sure to pay attention to Memorial's website, our Facebook page, um, to make sure that uh, you can get up-to-date information. Um, I know that we also have a large population of attendees today from our area employers. Uh, please know that we also are here to assist you in any way. Um, feel free to, to contact me. Um, Meredith Bogrell, you can call me, um, email me also. Um, feel free to chat back and forth if you do not have my contact information already. Um, we'll be back to assist you in that way. Um, no doubt if everybody, you know, continues to have questions as we go on and you know, we appreciate being able to answer all of those for you. Um, we do have, um, let's see, one more time for one more question here. Uh, Dr. Bunce, what is your opinion about balancing, for, like when protecting the older community and not negatively affecting their mental health due to isolation. Um, it goes on to say that a mother is in the assisted living facility and have not been able to give her a hug, you know, even since early March. You know, I can definitely tell that she has gone downhill. So kind of that mental health versus you know, physical safety balance. How do you know? Well, that, that's an excellent one question. I, I, you know, and, and no one has the exact right formula to determine that. Obviously, um, and also individuals are different. You know, some people require more social interaction to maintain mental health. And so I do believe you have to individualize it, but also understand circumstance. I mean, the nursing facilities are extraordinarily aware of the fact that how they manage the safety of their, of their, um, uh, their premises is directly related to mortality rates. As I said, 50% of all the people who have died in Indiana are greater than 80. So, um, 
you've got to balance it. I think visiting people as much as possible, outdoor visits are extremely important if that's possible. I know that uh, many nursing homes, uh, nursing facilities and extended care facilities are allowing that. Uh, I really think that the human touch is extremely important and that's a great question. And we can't forget that. We have to balance that though with, with the knowledge that uh, we have to remain safe so that if we visit, you know, um, we're responsible for transmission. And that's the whole idea about masking and, and living a responsible life during COVID times is because we're all in this together and, and we have to uh, work as a community. And that's a hard, for very individualistic people, that's a, hard, uh, that's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, but we really have to do things for others. And can you also answer, um, when might rapid testing be available in our area and here in Dubois County? Uh, rapid testing, well, it depends on what you're talking about. There are rapid PCR tests, but there's a rapid antigen test as well. And those, those are available, I mean, um, in some locations. The problem with the antigen test is that it's only 80% sensitive. So it, it, you know, if you're looking to rule out COVID with an 80% sensitive test in a relative low prevalence uh, situation, um, then you are unfortunately going to have a a, a fairly low negative predictive value on, on a negative result. And, and so I think that you have to be very careful about the rapid tests. Um, and, and unfortunately, we have a backlog of the really good high sensitivity PCR tests because of all the outbreaks around the country. And there's a lot of competition to get samples in and get people tested. So that the backlog is, is getting worse. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good.